is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, as I teased in the last episode, we've got a very special episode for you today. I know I've had a lot of people asking about this episode and when it was going to come out. So it is right here. It is ready for you. So I have been taking my time with this one because I wanted to make sure that it was going to work out well and that I could uh, present it to you guys in a way that you would enjoy and that you would like. So as I teased last week, this is going to be a basically a review of the debate that Andy Stanley and Jeff Durbin had on the Unbelievable podcast with the host Justin Brierly. And so if you're not familiar with the Unbelievable podcast, I've talked about it several times here on this show. It's basically a podcast that brings on people from divergent worldviews and then they come together and have have a debate about it. Now, what you might be thinking is just like any other debate that you've seen, you see these debates and they're just like firing things back and forth at each other. It kind of gets vitriolic at different points. But this is one of the most amazing podcasts because you'll have, you know, someone that's, uh, two people that used to be Muslim. One is now an atheist and one's now a Christian. And then they're kind of talking about their worldviews and everything, but very, very rarely does it get like catty or, uh, you know, people insulting each other back and forth. I think that has a lot to do. And there's a lot of the, um, I guess the positive goes to the host, Justin Brierly, uh, because he does a really good job of kind of playing referee. But even when he's not having to intercede, these people typically uh, don't just go at each other personally. They're kind of just talking about the ideas. So that's a, definitely a podcast for you guys to check out. It's unbelievable with Justin Brierly, and it comes out every Friday. Um, but I remember whenever this podcast was announced and I immediately got super giddy. And the reason is is because, you know, with the background is that, and I talked about it on episode 23 of this podcast. So if you've been listening for any length of time, I talked a little bit about it back then because Jeff Durbin has a ministry called Apologia Church uh, and he's a pastor of a church and he does a lot of uh, ministries on, you know, on the sidewalks outside of abortion clinics. And he goes straight to the Mormon temple and he's, you know, basically uh, preaching the gospel to these people. And he took a lot of offense to what basically went down with Andy Stanley. So if you don't know who Andy Stanley is, you've kind of been in living under a rock. So this is a guy who is the pastor of, at, at last I checked, the largest church in the United States. So it's just in the Atlanta area, but it's kind of a multi-site concept. And so you could definitely call him a mega church pastor. His father is Charles Stanley. So I know a lot of you guys know him. Maybe you grew up listening to him on the radio or watching him on television or something like that. So he comes from that ilk. But let's just say there was quite a bit of fracture uh, whenever Jeff Durbin was going at Andy Stanley and his worldview. Uh, and I listened to, you know, an entire hour, hour and a half long podcast where they're basically breaking down Andy Stanley's sermons and they're breaking down some of his worldviews on a very, very specific topic. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce this part, but basically what this podcast is going to be today is I'm going to bring in clips from their talk together. And so I've got the link to the entire talk in the description. It's a link to the YouTube page. So, you know, it's all good. You know, there's plenty of permission and all that going on with that. So you can just check it out there, but I want you to have some of the context and I want, I'm not going to show you every bit of this, this interaction. I'm not going to kind of go in and break down every sentence, but there's a lot of different parts where they're kind of going back and forth. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the clip and then I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. And then here at the end of the podcast, I'm actually going to give you an idea of who I think the winner was, right? And some people are like, Oh, you can't, you know, declare it a winner. It's a couple of Christian pastors and that's weird. But I mean, I don't, I don't care about that. Like, I just want to bring it to you in a way that I think is going to be interesting. And so we will be declaring a winner. And so what I'm going to do for you right now is I'm actually going to play for, for you the very first two minutes of this podcast. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be giving you the, uh, kind of the audio timestamp. So if you guys are watching this on the YouTube link or you're listening to it, you kind of have an idea of where I'm at at any point here, but Justin Brierly does a really good job of kind of giving you the background of where this debate comes from. So we're going to be coming in and out here, but let's go ahead and listen to the first couple of minutes here. Well, today on the show, we're asking, is it time to unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament? My guests are Andy Stanley and Jeff Durbin on the show today. Andy Stanley is a pastor, communicator, author, and the founder of North Point Ministries. And North Point Community Church is one of the largest churches in North America. His latest book is Irresistible, Reclaiming the New that Jesus Unleashed for the World. Andy says that to make Christianity the irresistible force that it was in the lives of the first followers of Christ, we need to be clear that the Bible isn't the foundation for faith in Christianity, rather the events documented by the New Testament, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the foundation. But too often, says Andy, Christians try to defend and incorporate the Old Testament into their faith. 
And we simply don't need to do that. We need to effectively unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament. Well, as you can imagine, since preaching on that topic and publishing the book, opinion has been split. Um, I read some Amazon reviews ranging from pure heresy to one of the most important books you'll ever read. And of course, uh, Andy has uh, had a number of people who have responded online on blogs, podcasts and elsewhere. Well, one of Andy's most vocal critics joins me on the show today to talk about the book. He's Jeff Durbin, pastor of Apologia Church in Arizona and founder of the popular YouTube channel Apologia Studios as well. He says that Andy is acting a bit like a modern-day Marcion, cutting Christianity off from the foundation of the Old Testament. And uh, Jeff believes that the Bible, both old and new, are the inspired and inerrant word given to us by God, and Christians are called to believe it and defend it all. So today we're looking at Andy's book, uh, Irresistible, and asking, is it time to unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament? All right, guys, so there you go. That's the intro to the talk that we're going to have today. So here's my encouragement to you right now, because we're about to get into the actual showdown. We're going to get into Stanley and Durbin going back and forth. But this is what I would really suggest to all of you to do, okay? I would suggest that you listen to this podcast episode, to this debate first in its totality, and then come back and and hear what we kind of have to say, and I'm going to kind of pull out the highlights. That would be probably the best thing for you. I know that's going to be a little bit annoying, especially if you're driving, you know, don't be, you know, clicking on the links and all that while you're driving. Wait till you get to a red light or something like that. But I've got the YouTube link there in the description. And wherever you get podcasts, I'm pretty sure the Unbelievable Podcast with Justin Brierly is on there. And so this was the second to last episode that was released. So you're going to see it right there, right there, ready for you to listen to it. Again, listen to it at one and a half or two times speed so you can kind of buzz through it. You'll still get the overall gist of it. But that would be my number number one recommendation for you is to go ahead and do that now and then come back and join us, you know, seven minutes or so into this podcast. And then we can kind of get going from there. But if you guys have done that and you've come back, welcome back. Here's the deal. We're going to go ahead and get into the showdown right here. And so this is going to be Andy Stanley. And we're basically going to be talking about the concept of quote unquote, unhitching the old Testament from Christianity. And this is around the nine minute and 21 second mark. So let's go ahead and get back into it. Um, we obviously um, the the topic today is 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 Andy's book. Um, this question of unhitching Christianity from the Old Testament. Uh, let's start with you, Andy. Just is, is that a fair assessment? Do you use those words specifically of of what you're doing in this book? Because a lot I've had lots of people with different opinions right. on what, what you're doing. Tell us what what the book is about, firstly. And, well, and, do you start with the book or with the word unhitched? Well, let's because let's start with unhitched. Yeah, what what do you okay. mean by unhitching um, the Christianity well, from the Old Testament? I don't want to spend too much time on this. So just interrupt me if this goes too long. That was a term I used in a particular sermon in a particular series. I guess really almost actually actually a year ago. Um, I just done a twelve part series through the life of Jesus leading up to resurrection. And um, it was going well. So I thought, hey, I'll I'll spend three weeks and just keep the story going narrative wise through Acts. So I spent three weeks on Acts. So in the message in Acts 15, where I talked about the Jerusalem Council and this momentous decision to, and the word I used was unhitch Christianity from the Sinai covenant, from circumcision. And again, whatever, I mean, everybody knows something happened there that was of extraordinary significance for the church. I used the word unhitch. And then to tease my next series, which was called The Bible for Grownups, I I made the comment, um, hey, and perhaps those of us modern Christians, I forget the exact words, we need to consider, we need to unhitch our Christianity from the Old Testament as well, kind of paralleling that there was a momentous detachment from um, what it meant to be a Jesus follower for Gentiles, that perhaps we need to think through some of those things ourselves. It really was a tease. In fact, in the message I said, and we will come back and talk about this more in the next few weeks, Well, and understandably so, people took that phrase and it sort of became (laughs) the banner under which I do all ministry. (laughs) And interestingly enough, in our churches, everyone was scratching their heads like, why is this such a big deal? Because I teach from the Old Testament all the time. In fact, that next series was a four-part series and two were from the book of Genesis. So in terms of my track record, nothing could be further from the truth that I don't teach from the Old Testament, don't believe the Old Testament, don't think the Old Testament points to Jesus. All the things people keep reminding me of on social media, I'm like, I know. And if you actually paid attention to my history of preaching, you'd know that. But again, hey, we're all busy. I don't expect everybody to drop in and listen to all my sermons. So that's that's kind of the history of how that word yeah. became associated with my whole view of Christianity. I do use the term 
in the context within a specific different context um, within the book. So, um, and then of course, and you guys can appreciate this. Then <laughs> the next rumor was, well, Andy wrote irresistible because of all the flack he got from the sermon. Well, the sermon book came out in September and nobody knows anything about publishing. You know, you, you don't get a book out that quick. So that that's kind of the brief history of the uh, term and my um, tainted reputation that perhaps I earned, but I, my communication style in our local church um, is super specific and I'm pretty consistent and I understand people who drop in from time to time, you know, may misunderstand my approach. And I, I, I take responsibility for that. So that kind of gives you an idea of where Andy Stanley's coming from and kind of his view on the whole situation and the little audio snafu with there with his audio was on his end when he was recording. So just so you know that, but here's the thing, guys, uh, just to kind of go back, I listen to Andy Stanley's sermons every week, pretty much. Um, cause he's one of my favorite pastors to listen to. I really like his ideas. I will say in the last several years, he's gotten way more Ted talky. Way more like, hey, let's just kind of like give you some good practical life tips type of thing. And he's always been a little bit that way, but I feel like he's even more so that way. So if that's not really your style, you're not really going to dig uh, some of his more recent content. But I got to be honest with you, uh, the sermon that he said this in, in the sermon series that he said this in, as I listened through it the first time, I just listened right through it and didn't have any problems with it whatsoever. It was only after the fact when I saw that it was basically everywhere in in Christian circles that, you know, Andy Stanley had done some sort of heretical uh, Martian type thing. Right. And so the, the, the point that he made there about how the people in his church that listen to him every week, they don't really, you know, react the same way as people on the outside. Like I'm with you because I don't attend his church, but it's almost like I do because I'm listening to his sermons every single week. So I knew where he was coming from. And so, again, if you go back to episode 23 of this podcast, it was entitled Andy Stanley, a heretic, question mark. And I said at the end that, no, I don't think he's a heretic. Uh, I think if you have a better idea of the context context through which he is speaking and some of the things that he's teaching in his teaching style, that it would make more sense. So that is Andy Stanley's basic overview. And again, that's kind of the crux of the whole issue here today. But what I want to get into now is I want to get into their theses, right? Because each one of them has a different thesis in terms of what they're going to be defending and kind of what they're going to be describing in the conversation today. And so the first one we're going to do is going to be at the 13 minute mark right around there. And it's basically, this is Andy Andy Stanley's thesis on the whole deal. And so I'll kind of give you a basic rundown of what the thesis is, but then beyond that, I'll give you a better idea of, well, here, let me just kind of give you a summary of it here. So uh, here's Andy Stanley's thesis. Uh, It's that the Bible is not the foundation of Christianity. The resurrection is. So it's not a difference in theology. It's more of a difference in approach. And thus, we need to come closer to the resurrection. Okay. So again, we're going to go into uh, around minute 13 here. So let's go back into the interview. As as I understand it, the book um, is is really actually what your primary concern is, is with reaching the next generation a a, a post-christian generation which as far as you can see um just doesn't necessarily buy into the idea that the bible is the word of god and so on and you have to start at a different place in that case and 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 it's uh, you're trying to say well actually we need to go back to the early church because they didn't have the bible as we have it either um and and just take us through that what 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 you're responding to how you think that we can in fact make the gospel irresistible again for this next generation yeah the a little bit of the backstory um is about nine years ago i was watching a video sam harris who was at a university setting you know doing his sam harris thing where he dismantles the bible and there goes christianity and it occurred to me wow there there is a false assumption that skeptics for generations have leveraged and have baited christians into this this debate um, and the under really what I can think is a false assumption. And the assumption is as the Bible goes, so goes Christianity. So if you dismantle the Bible, the Christianity goes away. You've undermined Christianity. If you, you know, if it's a 66 um, card house of cards, if you pull out Genesis, pull out Leviticus, pull out Revelation, the whole thing comes tumbling down, which is just not true. And I thought this is, uh, you know, once upon a time, maybe this didn't matter because you had to buy tickets to debates. Who's going to read their books. But now every middle school or high school or college student, has access to all that misinformation and now you can find out what else is in the bible think about this without ever opening a bible or owning a bible or even holding a bible and so i just felt compelled this is really about nine years ago 
to step back on sort of the classical apologetic method that I was taught. I mean, I certainly I didn't make any of this up, you know, 35, almost 40 years ago to say, hey, I would like to re to, the way I say it is I would like to tether the faith of this generation to the event that created the movement that eventually brought us the Bible to tether their faith to the event that launched the movement that eventually brought us the Bible. So none of this is new. It really just is a, a different approach. And it's really putting the spotlight in terms of the foundation of our faith on the event of the resurrection, which <laughs> every apologist who ever debates any of the new atheist or anybody else, eventually they get to the issue of the resurrection because the documents documenting the resurrection aren't dependent on an, an inerrant scripture. They're just dependent on a historically reliable scripture. So you know, that's, that was the thing that, that motivated me. And so I've been talking about this for many, many years and I kept being misunderstood as people kind of dropped into specific sermons. So one afternoon, Dr. Geisler, he's 86 now, he called me at home. I remember standing on the front porch. He said, Andy, you have to write about this. I'm like, I don't want to write about this. That's, that's not my thing. I mean, that's technical. That's a, you know, he says, no, you're going to continue to be misunderstood. If you don't write about this, it's not enough to talk about it. So I did a little short ebook called um, why the Bible tells me so isn't enough anymore. And then eventually I um, wrote irresistible. So my, my heartbeat or the reason I did all of this really is to shift the approach, to shift the conversation and to really, I, I mean, I ask church leaders all the time, what's the faith of the next generation worth? And I think it's worth everything. And so I just began to want to help church leaders tether the faith of this generation to the event of the resurrection that brought us the movement, the church that eventually brought us the Bible. So it's nothing new. It's really just sequential. And um, anyway, but I understand why it's a little bit, you know, why well, it makes people nervous. Sure. I get that. Sure. So again, the thesis there that he's saying is that the Bible is not the foundation of Christianity. The resurrection is, okay? And that it's not a difference in theology. It's a difference in approach. And thus, we need to come closer to the resurrection because it was the event that led to the movement that led to the Bible, right? So that is his main idea. And so the thing that you have to ask yourself is, do you agree with that argument? Because I got to say, just from a practical level, just from a practical base level, it makes sense, right? Because we get a lot of our, our, our ideas about things from today and what we think is right and wrong based on what we learn from the reality of the gospel. And the reality of the gospel comes to us because of an event that occurred, right? But Jeff Durbin, this is going to be the first time we're going to be hearing from him. He's got a different thesis, right? And so this is kind of my summary of Jeff Durbin's thesis, and then I'm going to let, it give, let him give it to you his way. So his thesis is the Bible is the foundation of Christianity. Our theology will lead us to our practice and methodology, and thus we need to come closer to the Word of God. Okay, so we're going to start at about the 18 and a half minute mark. So if you want to meet us there, that is where we're going into now. So let's get into Jeff Durbin's response and his thesis for this discussion. Um, Jeff, uh, let's bring you in at this point. Um, one one of the things that um, Andy says in his book is in light of the post-Christian context in which we live, it's time to stop appealing to the authority of a sacred book to make the case for Jesus. In the information age, that habit unnecessarily undermines the credibility of our faith. It makes our message unnecessarily resistible. And, and so a, a lot of what I think Andy is getting at which then the Old Testament kind of comes into is this idea that we can't speak to skeptics from a position of asking them to accept the inerrancy infallibility of, of the Bible. We've got to start on this ground of, OK, well, let's look at this as a historical document. Are these do these claims stand up historically as true? What what do you make of that particular approach, I suppose, to apologetics generally? Um, and 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 obviously we'll then start to talk about how it how it keys into the Old Testament stuff. No, oh, thank you very, very much. I think it's it's important. Uh, Andy said that it's uh, not a difference in theology. It's a, a difference in approach in terms of approaching the law of God and, and, and these issues. Um, I think it's important because it, I think it is deeply theological. The theology underneath us as a foundation will lead to practice and to methodology. And in terms of where we're at today with a culture that's where it's at today, I think we need to get closer and closer to the worldview and the theological foundation of the apostles that were preaching in the book of Acts and how they were approaching the world. And in order to do that, we have to go to the text itself. And I think what you can see just universally throughout the scriptures 
is an appeal to the self-attesting authority of the Word of God, always and in every case. Even when bringing up something like an example like the resurrection of Jesus, uh, Peter actually says, and, and Andy refers to this in some of his work, in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19, when he refers to the fact that we were eyewitnesses to his glory, he then goes on to say, but we have something more sure, the prophetic word. And so he bases actually the certainty and the, and the surety of his testimony, not on the fact that they were eyewitnesses. He, of course, mentions that we were eyewitnesses to him, but he has something more sure, the prophetic word. And I think this is interesting, too. And I would just say this with and I, and I love and respect Andy a, a tremendous amount. Um, but I think it's providential, uh, brothers, that in this moment we have uh, just behind us in the last week or so, we have William Lane Craig, who is a brilliant, brilliant man, uh, who I think is probably the best out of any of us to talk about the historical evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all those things. He's a brilliant man. And he was talking to another brilliant man that I've actually had on my program, uh, Ben Shapiro. Um, and he was talking about the resurrection. Now, there's a, there, yet anybody can go see this online. I'd encourage you to do so. When Dr. Craig... Um, points the, as to the historical evidences and the logical logical consistency of the resurrection of Jesus Christ <clears throat> at the very end of this strand of amazing evidences and logical argumentation, Ben Shapiro's answer is, I find that uninteresting. And I think that goes back to the issue of it's where Andy says it's not a difference in theology, it's a difference in, in approach. And I think that it is um, an issue of theology and uh, the condition of man, because in that case, I think we need to look what the scriptures say about someone like, say, Ben Shapiro, <clears throat> when there's an argument of historical evidences and logical consistency. The problem, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, is not a lack of evidence or knowledge of God. Paul says that we all know God, that the problem is that we're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness for that which is known about God is evident within them. And here's what it says for God has made it evident to them. So the problem is, is a sinful suppression of the truth, not that we're no neutral towards God, that we just don't have enough evidence or light or information. The problem is actually breaking through that sinful suppression of the truth. And it's not to say that we don't use historical evidences and have those things. It's to say that that's not really the problem. The problem is, is that we won't take God at his self-attesting word, we won't believe God. We don't want his word. And I'll just say one final word on that in terms of what we build on. Um, after the resurrection, so post-cross and post-resurrection, when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus, there's a moment where he chastises these people who now see him alive from the dead. And what does he chastise them for? He chastises them for not believing all that the prophets and Moses had, had spoken concerning him. And so there's, there's a consistent theme throughout the scriptures of the self-attesting nature of the word of God. And that the problem with fallen humanity is not a lack of evidence, insufficiency of evidence, a lack of good logical argumentation. The problem is that we are rebels against the king. We don't want God in our thinking. And so what we do is we exchange him for an idol. And, and again, you see just this consistency throughout the Old and New Testament that the problem is, is that we will not accept God at his word. And the answer from Scripture is Romans 1.16. It's the good news. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. That's what God uses to raise people to life. But I think we need to ask ourselves the question, do we believe that Christ is the foundation of all knowledge, all knowledge, or not? And I'll just say one final word here so I don't uh, go on too far and take too much time, that when we talk about um, uh, approaching the current atheistic or unbelieving or agnostic culture and worldview with the Christian worldview, and we try to cater our theological approach or apologetic methodology to it, I think that we're, um, we're losing the strength of the biblical worldview and the gospel when we step into the unbeliever's position and we assume neutrality along with them and we try to actually borrow from their, um, their standards and methodology rather than actually showing them that without the biblical worldview, without starting with Christ in your thinking, there is no meaningful appeal to logic. There's no meaningful appeal to evidences. Um, we don't have uniformity in nature, which is the foundation of all appeals to evidence whatsoever, without the biblical God. So if we don't start 
with the self-attesting word of God under our feet, standing on it, we don't even have a coherent appeal as Christians to laws of logic, uh, to, to morality, ethical appeals, or to an appeal to yeah. any evidence at all. What? So there you have the beginning of Jeff Durbin's response. So again, in in my opinion, this is his thesis. It's that the Bible is the foundation of Christianity. Our theology will lead us to our practice and theology, and thus we need to come closer to the Word of God. And so here's the thing, is right after you hear Andy make a lot of sense, well then... Jeff Durbin comes in and he starts to make a lot of sense, right? And his big thing is you can kind of tell he's starting to build his argument against the apologetic only approach. And and typically it's that apologetic approach where it's basically looking at logic and reasoning and things that exist outside of the Bible. And so I'm not necessarily going to get into my opinion on that just yet, but he made a very interesting comment and he makes it several times um, throughout his uh, throughout this speech, or throughout this debate, rather, uh, when he's talking about the interaction between Ben Shapiro and William Lane Craig. And so, obviously, Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro Show, conservative commentator, Orthodox Jew, William Lane Craig, one of the foremost, if not the foremost, apologist on the planet, debater, all those different things. And so, Ben Shapiro had William Lane Craig on his Sunday special. And so, that's just his Sunday show uh, that he does that's outside of his normal show, but it's more of a long-form interview-type show. And so I would encourage all of you, and the link is in the description here, to go and watch that interaction because you're basically watching somebody that, uh, you know, has the gospel and the the Judaic or the, you know, Judeo-Christian worldview basically coming out of every pore of his body and William Lane Craig, and he knows how to argue it. And he, he is a genius and he's talking to Ben Shapiro. And I thought it was pretty enlightening. This is more towards the end of their conversation where he does make this very cogent and, and very powerful argument about how we really should depend on Jesus and the gospel and those types of things. And Ben Shapiro does just straight up look at him as an Orthodox, Orthodox Jew and just say, yeah, that's not really that interesting to me. And so you have to wonder, he's basically spent, I think it was about 45, 50 minutes into that conversation, basically buttering Ben Shapiro up, basically dropping some knowledge on this really, really smart guy who's really, really dumb in terms of his particular worldview uh, as it pertains to Jesus Christ and the, the truth of the gospel. And that was his response. I, yeah, I'm just not really that interested in it. So it just kind of is what it is. It was a very interesting interaction. And so I thought that was a very effective thing for Jeff Durbin to do, which is to drop that in here. Now, the thing about the start of this conversation between Stanley and Durbin is that it started out very, very polite. They were really, really polite towards one another. And it was, it was almost disappointingly, like slobberingly too polite. And I was like, really, are we just going to, for, you know, an hour and 15 minutes, have y'all say how much you like the other one and how you don't really want to make this a disputation type of a thing. But then it turns and it turns relatively quickly in terms of the totality of the conversation. Okay. So, uh, at this point, uh, we're looking at like, uh, around the 37 minute mark. So like 36, 47, something right there. Durbin had just finished kind of a lengthy diatribe about a number of different issues and Stanley pretty much ignored that. He pretty much didn't engage with any of the information that Durbin just brought before this moment. And then uh, we, we, we possibly have the most important interaction of the entire debate. Okay. And so again, this is at like the 36, 47 mark right around in there. And it goes to about 43, 30. So let's go ahead and get back into the debate here. Okay, good. Lots to to engage with there, Andy. I mm-hmm. I, I, I suppose my, my question is, um, interestingly, you know, Jeff brings up the Oropagus and the way Paul interacts yeah. there in in Acts yeah, seventeen. Yeah, the sermon where Paul never even told them who he was talking about. Right, and and you use this as an example in your book of of the you yeah. know to support your case. I think. I, think, I mean. I think Jeff. I think you just went in a circle. So let me ask you a couple questions. I mean, what? See, here's my opinion. Um, if Christ has not been raised, your preaching and your faith is useless, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. It's not original with me, you know that. And yeah. also, you don't believe, oh, I, I shouldn't say that. Do you believe Peter and John believe Jesus was the Messiah between the crucifixion and the resurrection, or did something happen to their faith after the resurrection? I mean, and, and it's people always go to the Luke, um, six, is it Luke 16? Yeah, Luke 16 passage, or is it, yeah, Luke 16, um, 
which is so silly to me, okay? Because Jesus is in a parable. He's talking in a parable. Let me read the verse right, no, let me read the verse right before this. The law and the prophets, this is, I mean, this is, now this is Jesus, these are Jesus' words teaching. The, the reference you just gave us was within the context of a parable about Abraham's right. wisdom and all that. Right. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, John the Baptist. Since that time, the good news contrast, since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. Um, so, I mean, I get the parable thing. We can, we can talk about that. And, and you and I both spend our days exegeting scripture. But more to the point is the apostle Paul saying, okay, if there's no resurrection, Christ isn't raised. If Christ isn't raised, game over. He doesn't say, but we have the law and the prophets, and we still have the apocalypse of John, and which haven't been written yet, of course. We still have it. In other words, the whole thing is the resurrection. And to, to your point about um, William Lane Craig's conversation, I, I, I agree with you. What's going on in the hearts of men and women in terms of their response or openness or their election? Again, we have no control over that. I'm just talking about how we approach them with our conversation. And I doubt we would take a very different approach, not talking about approaches, but in terms of actual conversation. So when my kids were little, not little, when they were going into high school and college, I said to them, look, you know, when you get in a literature class or biology class and people bring up questions about the Old Testament or some of the, what may be considered odd stories in the Bible, I said, don't get in a big spitting match with them about this. Here's here's your your answer. You know what? Yes, that's strange. Yes, that's odd. No, I can't explain that. But did you know Jesus believed that? And I just figure if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever that person says. Now that's not a convincing argument. It's tethering our faith to the event of the resurrection that the course confirmed what Jesus taught, and it confirmed what Jesus taught about the law and the prophets. So again, it's a, it's sequential is the difference. And anyway, so I, back to my question. So do you believe anything happened to Peter and John after the resurrection? I mean, because again, I think where you're incorrect or where you kind of smoothed over it, the, the sermons that we find at the beginning of Acts are all about the resurrection. They're not repeating the Sermon on the Mount. They're not repeating the story of the Good Samaritan. It's you crucified, you know, you murdered, you killed the author of life. God raised him and we've seen him. So those early sermons were all about the resurrection because something extraordinary had happened. So anyway, and you know all that. I, I'm not, this isn't new information. This is just what we emphasize and how we sequence it. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, so Jeff. I think I'll, I'll work my way backwards, Andy, and I appreciate all those questions very, very much. And I'll just stand on the one point when you say, you know, if somebody rises from the dead, I'm going to go with what they say. I'll believe what they say. And I think this does go, go back to fundamental principles in terms of how do we approach the world and miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, in the law of God itself, we have a standard, a principle by which we're, we're told by God to test prophets and those who claim they're from God in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 5 uh, God even tells his people he says even if someone comes and they have signs and wonders so they have signs and wonders it looks legit it looks like the miraculous is happening he says this but they lead you after other gods gods which you have not known that's how you know they're a false prophet and God says that you're not to listen to the voice of that prophet God is, is testing you to see if you love him and so God has, even at that point in history, given his people a principle that you test all things, even miracles, by the foundation of God's own previous revelation of himself. But, so, and, but and, come on, and the Gospels, look, look, I mean, you know this, this is history. You, I know you believe this. Of course. They go to an empty tomb, they assume grave robbers. And then Jesus appears and their faith comes back to life and their message is about what we've seen. We are witnesses and we have seen it. So and Andy, they were chastised for that. Don't forget that. We're, we're missing that. That's important. And I don't think we should smooge over that. Um, wait, wait, they were what? Jesus on the road to Emmaus with their confusion saying, oh, we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to, to, to rescue Israel, all those things. How, what does Jesus say to them? He says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He actually chastises them, Andy. He chastises them for not believing what? Believing in his own word, the previous revelation of God. And so whatever their confusion was at that moment, Jesus chastises them 
for not believing what the prophets had spoken about him. I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't get the connection, but I, I mean, yeah, but that's not really the point I'm making. But anyway, well, and, and just and just back to the to the signs and wonders issue. When you say if someone rises from the dead, I'm going with them. Andy, you know as well as I, I know. No, no, no. I'm tying this specifically to the resurrection of I, Jesus. No, I know, and I, I make I'm making a point on that. Um, so what is the foundation of your faith? I mean, why do you believe what you believe? The word of the living God. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff went there. Uh, yeah, that was your mic drop moment of uh, this really the entire debate i remember listening to this uh while i was driving in the truck and i was like oh geez because you can tell during this whole interaction andy's starting to get a little bit frustrated right so he's interrupting you know he's trying to say no this was that wasn't my point this is my point you know towards the end of that little clip you can tell he's being a little bit dismissive like oh well that's not really my point but whatever and then he thinks he's got the gotcha question and he asks Jeff Durbin, basically, what is the foundation of your faith? And then he just nails him between the eyes, the word of the living God. And I listened to this at two times speed and the gap between Durbin saying the word of the living God and Andy saying, okay, it was even long when listening to it at two times speed. Andy Stanley had no idea how to respond. And Justin Brierly had no idea how to intercede. And if you watch the video of it, you can actually see these guys on video talking and Andy Stanley is just frozen. And then he just kind of shrugs his shoulders like, okay, like it was a huge point. Now it's not exactly a turning point because there was a whole lot of interaction that came after this, but you know, this was a huge moment for, uh, for Durbin here because you can tell Andy's starting to get a little flustered and Durbin is just calm. And it's like, he knows what's coming. He knows what he's going to do. And then he just kind of goes from there. Now, a little while, uh, like right after this clip, we kind of get into Andy Stanley asking, uh, just in general, but mainly asking towards Jeff Durbin, you know, would there be a Bible if we didn't have the resurrection? So this was an interesting little interaction. So let's go back into the clips here. I, I mean, the, the, in that sense, I'll just come in here, Jeff. When When you are actually, though, evangelizing, speaking to someone about Jesus, about Christianity, how how does that make a difference? Because for, for 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 Andy, as far as I I understand it, he's going to tell them about Jesus, about his life, right. death, and resurrection, and he's going to say you should trust this this man, you should trust yes. in this. Um, and he's not going to say, and I'm also going to tell you everything about the Old Testament and everything else in the scriptures, because uh, yeah. there's a certain whole other set of stuff you need to believe. Right. I, I'm assuming you're also going to tell them about Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. But, okay. but how, how does your presuppositional approach kind of make it any different to the way Andy's going to going to introduce people to the gospel? Because no, I, 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 I really I really appreciate how you asked that, Justin. It's important because, yes, that is exactly what we do when we go out to the Mormon temple, when we go out to uh, downtown Phoenix, when we go to the abortion clinic to go and, and, and minister to the mothers and fathers there. We're preaching Christ. We're preaching him crucified and his resurrection. We're calling people to repentance and faith. But what we're talking about here is actually how we begin to to engage in the defense of the faith, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, about apologetics. And what I think we need to recognize is that, again, from the Old Testament, literally from the book of Genesis onward, there's the assumption of the self-attesting word of God as the foundation of the proclamation. And so what I'm saying is, is that we're not basing it upon... Uh, a neutral position of saying something like, well, there's this person historically that, uh, that people say rose from the dead, and so I'm going with what they say. No, we're saying it's actually much stronger than that. There's a stronger appeal at the bottom of that. Let and me ask you this question. Would there be a Bible if there had been no resurrection? It, what, can you explain that a little more? Would there be a Bible if there had been yeah, no would resurrection? Would we have the Bible, but not yeah. not the old law and the prophets, but I mean this extraordinary piece of literature we call the bible with the jewish the hebrew bible or jewish scriptures whatever you call it and the new testament documents would that even exist for us if there had been no resurrection well i would say it'd be impossible for there to have not been a resurrection the first century wait, church wait. The, the, the first then, century church had um a bible one of the things that you you talk about which but, i, I well, think maybe, but would we have our bible if there had been no resurrection well 
again, when we, when you ask the question like that, it's interesting because the the Greek Septuagint, which the early Christians had, no, but just an, this is yes or no. <laughs> I'm trying. No, actually, I'm, I'm I'm answering the question. That Bible that they had, that they actually knew about, that was held up in the temple, that um, they all had access to. The law, and the, the law and the prophets had prophesied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a guaranteed and sure event in history. But of course, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, there then, there, then we'd be we'd be uh, to be pitied. We'd, there'd be no faith, of course. But we there, know would be no, there would be no Bible. That well, there, there would be there would be no, nothing to be, in terms of believing in this man who said he was the Messiah. There would be, but I know, but there would be no Bible, correct? The old, well, the Old Testament said that the Messiah was going to rise again from the dead. Right, sort of. Nobody expected a resurrection, but if there had been no resurrection, there would be no the B I B L E, and you and I would know virtually nothing about the Law and the Prophets because we learned everything we learned about the Law and the Prophets in church, and it would have been you know relegated to the Enuma Elish or some other Babylonian myth, and some we'd have studied it in school. But there would be no Bible if there had not been a resurrection. Well, I think that that's a non sequitur in terms of trying to create a disjunction between the no, old and the but, but, No, 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 it's not, no. Because there's one unified we, revelation. And I think that's actually the, the major point of conflict between us is that um, – is that Christians historically have seen that this is there's an organic unity between the Old and New Testaments and the sovereign. I, I agree because Jesus rose from the dead and his story was worth telling. Because it was and prophesied that he would done so. Let, 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 and let, Gentiles let, began to take the Hebrew scriptures seriously because they took a Hebrew script seriously. Jesus. It, again, it's sequential. So after taking that huge overhand right, I feel like Andy Stanley had a pretty good counterpunch right here because you had Andy Stanley on his heels a little bit and then Durbin says what he says, right? He, he hits him with the word of the living God. And then this is Andy's immediate response. I mean, uh, Durbin got to talk for a little bit, but then Andy would just like, let's get to the crux of the matter. Would there be a Bible? Would there be a B-I-B-L-E if we didn't have the resurrection? And you could tell that Durbin was kind of struggling with coming up with a great response. Right. And so this is kind of the tit for tat thing that we have going here. And this is kind of where you first start seeing that they're kind of talking past one another a little bit. You sense that there is some common ground, but neither one of them's really wanting to give an inch here. And so that that kind of carries itself through the rest of the interview here, the rest of the debate. So a little while later, around the 51 minute mark, hopefully I've been giving you guys the uh, timestamps. I can't really remember, but around the 51, 51, 20 uh, minute mark, uh, we have Andy Stanley kind of come again with basically like the the who is Jesus part. And so we're going to see a nice little quick interaction between him and Jeff Durbin here. So let's go back in around, again, it's around the 51 minute and 19 or 20 second mark. And and, and 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 when it comes to that in that sense you 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 feel that too often the church is trying to do too much work when they approach the skeptic and the non-believer by by kind of um having to try and defend vast reams of scripture and right um, right, it, right. Uh, and that's the point is we the pressure is not on us to defend everything in the bible in, in terms of if, again if we're having a conversation with somebody who will give us enough time to even have these conversations which we all know is rarer and rarer the issue is and here's where we all agree the issue is who is jesus and if i mean that that's it that's the most important question anybody can ask who is jesus and you know i that's where it begins and once that question settled honestly i don't care if they become calvinist or covenant or dispensational i, I don't really care i just want people to embrace the fact that jesus paul said it he died on the cross for sin and was buried he you know rose from the dead so that's the issue. And then how we organize it, how we um, categorize it. Those are interesting conversations to have. But I think where we all three agree is how do we get people to engage yeah. in that conversation and arrive at the conclusion that Jesus is who the Apostle Paul yeah. believed Jesus was. So obviously, Andy Stanley's making quite a bit of a reductionist argument there, kind of breaking it down to its most basic levels. But you got to be honest, guys. Have you, haven't you had interactions before with people where you felt like you were having, you're trying to talk to people about Jesus and all they want to ask you about is Jonah and the whale, right? They want to ask you about Noah's Ark. They want to ask you about Adam and Eve and the snake. And they want to ask you about those types of things. And so here you are, if you're not a skilled debater, if you're, if you're not skilled at kind of keeping things on task, you're, you're kind of drowning a little bit, like no pun intended with Noah, but that's kind of the deal is like, that's what you feel like. 
is that you're you're stuck kind of defending things that are in the Old Testament that you don't fully understand, that you don't really understand the context. You're you're stuck seeing, well, isn't there slavery in the Old Testament? And didn't, you know, God smite entire groups of people? And didn't, you know, hit God's people go in and slaughter women and children? Like you're stuck having to do all those things. And it's not that those topics aren't important. It's just that that does kind of take you away from the central point of contention, which is, did Jesus die? Did he rise again? And did he do that for your sins? Is he your pathway to salvation? So again, another good point by Andy Stanley here, but let's go ahead and get into Jeff Durbin's response. Well, I think it's important if I could just just bring in here, uh, Justin, that in 1 Corinthians 15, when the apostle Paul talks about if Christ is not raised and our faith is in vain, um, I think it's important to point to where he continues to go from there. The foundation of his hope with the resurrection of Jesus Christ is based upon the uh, based in the Old Testament prophecies. He mentions no, uh, it's not. No, it's not. Well, it's I, I can based, just Andy. Let me finish no. the thought. Let me, let me it's just based the on an event in his life. He listen. Well, he was the first. Andy, let me finish. Let, let, let's let's allow Jeff to finish his thought there, Andy, and then then I'll okay, bring you back in. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So he he then goes on to tell a story. My point here is that the resurrection itself is not just an event in history; it's an event in history that's connected to the promises of God, which you would agree with, Andy. I'm sure I know that you will. But you're creating a disjunction at this point, and you're saying it's just the event in history. You just need to know about this event in history. The Apostle Paul, in fact, does in First Corinthians 15. Yes, he does quote scripture. Scripture, Psalm 110.1, he must reign until he's put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is death, and that's when he delivers the kingdom over to the Father. So he does actually connect the Old Testament prophecies of Messiah right inside there. It's it's in tandem. My point wow. here is that you, you, you have to see the resurrection the way that the early Christians did, and that, the, and that is that it has meaning because... It is connected to the promises of God in the biblical worldview. It's not just an miraculous event out there in the world sort of suspended. I, I agree with all that. I agree with all that. Finish, let me finish the thought. And this gets back to, to before I, I, I didn't get a chance to finish the thought. When God gives a test of a prophet, he says, even if they have signs and wonders, but they lead you after other gods. What's that mean? God's previous revelation of himself is the standard. It's the testing point. So even if you have somebody rise again from the dead, and Andy, you and I know, we're pastors, you and I know that we have to deal with people who are deluded today by a lot of this, uh, you know, these people who are doing these false miracles and making legs grow and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know bringing people up on stage that have been preset to come up there and stand up and all those things. Well, there's signs, there's wonders, there's miracles. There are people who have even claimed in history to have raised people from the dead. Right. Just because there's a sign and wonder doesn't mean that it actually accords with biblical truth. The standard is the word of God as the starting point that gives meaning to the resurrection of Jesus. So you can see there, Andy, again, was trying to hop in and finally Justin Brierly was like, hey, hey, man, let's let let's let Durbin make his point because Durbin doesn't, you know, I don't think ever in this interview actually uh, interrupt Andy Stanley. But again, you can see the the differences between their two approaches, right? Andy Stanley's the pragmatist, the practical. Let's look at the event. And Jeff Durbin's like, no, 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 it's bigger than the event. And the reason why we know it's bigger is because we can go back to the scriptures and actually prove we have a proof in the Old Testament that says, look, these events were preordained. We knew this was coming and we knew it was coming because of this. And that actually undergirds the entire thing, right? It undergirds the event. And so that's an an interesting kind of uh, back and forth between them. But, but at one point here, as we're getting towards the end a little bit around the 56 minute and 19 second mark, you see Briarly kind of come in and he's asking Andy Stanley, he's like, Hey, you know, we're almost an hour into this thing. What's the rub, right? You know, we know where's the disagreement, Right. And so he asks Andy Stanley this and Andy Stanley doesn't have a response. He's like, I don't know. Like, I don't really know what the rub is. And so Durbin actually chimes in and says, well, actually, I do. I know what the rub is. I know where the disagreement's coming. And so this is Durbin's response to that. So I think the point is, is that um, Andy and I would both confess together. We would be we'd stand hand in hand together that um, there's prophecy of Jesus. Uh, these prophecies give meaning to the resurrection of Jesus. My point is, is that I'm saying stand there as the grounding at all points. And Andy is arguing that we just need to have it event driven, just to announce the event 
The event is what gives it its foundation. The event happens. And what I'm saying is, is that if there's no grounding underneath that event that gives it meaning and context, then ju it's, just, it's just a miraculous event claim. And it's just as easily dismissed by someone like Ben Shapiro who says, I find it very uninteresting. So again, at this point, there's been punch, there's been counter punch, but you see Durbin trying to kind of bring some consistency here because I got to admit by an hour into this thing, I was a little confused as well, right? Because I'm very familiar with both of these guys' ministries and I know what their worldviews are and I kind of have an idea of how they exegete scripture and all those things because I've been listening to each of them for years, Andy, for a little bit longer, but I've been listening to both of them. But this was a very good summary, you know, in less than a minute of, hey, hey, this is, this is where we disagree. Because Andy was very flummoxed at this point, and he's just like kind of exasperated. He's like, "What? Well, yeah, I, I don't really know where where we're disagreeing. I don't know why Jeff's not really getting my point." And Jeff's like, "Look, this is the point, right?" And then this leads uh, a few minutes later, right at the one hour mark. So like one hour and a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds after that, rather. Um, it kind of gets into this whole, there was a very interesting uh, interaction here about can we just say the Bible says. Right. So some people have kind of come come against that and said, man, in 2019, you can't argue. Well, the Bible says, right, like that just doesn't work now. And believe me, like I've I've been kind of pulled into some of those arguments in, in some of the previous episodes. And we we're talking about abortion. You hear people that are very, very angry at pro-lifers that don't use the Bible. They're angry at pro-lifers that only use uh, science or logic or any of those types of things. And they're not appealing to a Christian worldview, to the Imago Dei or something like that. And so this kind of gets a little bit into that territory. So again, uh, if you're following along, it's at one hour and about two seconds. And so let's go ahead and get back into the debate here. Around. I do want to get, though, to the issue of the Old Testament a bit more specifically in, in this last segment, folks, because inevitably, Andy, that's where a lot of the um, controversy and uh, confusion in some ways of, about the book and what you've preached has, has come. People thinking that you're effectively saying rather, like, as I mentioned, like Marcion, um, that um, second century heretic who said we, we just need to ditch the Old Testament. You know, uh, it was almost a completely diff gods, different yeah. God of the Old and New Testament. And, and as I understand it from what you're saying, Andy, you're, you're not saying anything like that. Um, but in that last section, Jeff was saying, hang on, when Paul went to the synagogues, he he showed them that G Jesus was the Messiah from the scriptures. And we've got to start with the scriptures. That's why he says you're, you're missing a point there if you think we start with the event. No, we start with the scripture, which the event is, if you like, the fulfillment of. Um, but but then, so so what's your problem with that? And, and if we're not speaking to a specifically Jewish audience, right. does that give us a different reason, a different well, methodology, Andy? I think, again, these are not the Apostle Paul's words, but I think this was his intent. Um, whatever it takes by, I mean, the apostle Paul, these are his words by all possible means that I might win some. So if the old Testament is an on-ramp, great. If the resurrection is an on-ramp, great. If my personal experience is an on-ramp, great. If brokenness and tragedy in a person's life is an on-ramp, great. If a sick child is an on I mean, whatever the on-ramp is to faith, I'm all for it. And, and I, I think we would all three agree with that. And so for some people, the Old Testament is an on-ramp. And I'm not, not, I would never, of course, never discount that. The interesting thing is my Jewish friends who are Christians, <laughs> all of them came to faith. Two of them came to faith. All of them came to faith in Protestant churches. None of them came to faith through, a Jew, through the Old Testament as an on-ramp. But I had a professor at DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, who did come to faith as a young Jewish college student through the on-ramp of, of the Old Testament that was presented to him as by a Christian. So I'm not, I mean, an on-ramp to faith and recognizing who Jesus is and that spark of life that comes to life once they hear and how they're going to hear if somebody doesn't go, I'm a, I'm a hundred percent for all of that. So, um, so again, I, and I think we would all three agree with that. But, so I'm certainly not trying to remove any sort of on-ramp to, to faith, for but, sure. But, but it, what I'm getting, though, is that in your view, for a post-Christian society where there, there may yeah, be very... You can't start with the Bible says the Bible. I mean, you can. The Bible says the Bible says the Bible says. But here's the thing. Everybody else now knows what else the Bible says. It, it, it's So now I'm beginning to spit and match on the six-day creation, young earth, old earth, Levitical law, homosexuality. I mean, it's like, oh, gosh, you know, we're, the issue is who is jesus that's the issue and if you get that straight the dominoes start falling and um you know 
good directions for the most part. I think the only way we can get there, Andy, is by saying the Bible says. No, we, Bible, we don't have to way. say that. If I, if I could finish the thought, the Bible says that Jesus rose again from the dead. That's no, how it actually know. doesn't say that. That's how you know Jesus rose from the dead, because the biblical witness gives you that testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. You just changed terminology, which is a very subtle but important shift in terminology. I, I didn't. Uh, that Bible is where you get the message that Jesus rose again from the dead. Both no, both. it's it's not. <clears throat> well, explain so where, that, Andy. Where, where you, explain that. What, what do you mean by saying the Bible doesn't say that Jesus rose from the dead? <laughs> because the Bible doesn't say anything. John did. Moses did. David did. And that's Jesus in the Bible. Did, Paul did. But it was only in the Bible once it got put in the Bible. Here's the way of thinking about it. That's incoherent. Andy. Well, well let's, no, let's allow it, Andy it, to no, finish his, his let's allow Andy you, to finish his thought there, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. You Andy. don't put you don't put something in a safe to make it valuable. You put it in a safe because it's valuable. The New Testament documents were collected and protected and meticulously copied because very early on they were recognized as valuable. And in in the fourth century, these pre-existing valuable witnesses and documents were collected and put in a document that somebody, we don't know who, titled the Bible. So sequentially, that's how we got our Bible. And so this is one of the things I argue for in my book. In fact, I've been teaching this for seven years, that when we preach and teach, instead of citing the Bible, we just drop back and say, John, an eyewitness of the resurrection says, Paul, who steps onto the pages of history as someone who hated the church, says, Jesus said, um, you know, we cite James, the brother of Jesus. What would it take to convince your brother who's the son of God? James said, drop back, cite the authors. And again, it, it's just a different way. It's a different approach. And it, and, it's and, and obviously it's more accurate. And, and, and before you come back in, Jeff, um, you believe actually that this is a more evangelistically effective way of presenting the well, claims as, I as well. Know it is because I've been doing it for years and, the, you know, I, I hear the stories, read the emails and get the thank you notes. Hey, I finally brought my brother. And, you know, I, yes, it's more effective. And, and it's what the early church did. So. It's what Jesus did. Sometimes Jesus said the law and the prophets. Sometimes Jesus says Moses. Sometimes Jesus says David. So, you know. And and, 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 and and I suppose this is the point, Jeff, is that the early church, they, they were, you know, doing the stuff that we now see as this this authoritative, infallible, infallible word in the New Testament. So they, they were, were by definition they weren't referring to all of the documents that we that you would now say 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 are, are the word of god jeff so so I, I think this is the point andy's driving at is if they could do it so can we we don't have to as as it were um say the bible says it's it's the the testimony of who the bible then records that, that that's yeah. the important part of that but you yeah, right. and it was think, inspired yeah yeah but, there's and there's there's a, just a difference in in perspective here and this this controversy actually goes back to, to the time of the reformation in terms of um is is it the scriptures that create the church is it the scriptures uh, that have the ultimate self-attesting authority or does the church recognize and 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 declare the the scriptures to be the authoritative word of god which which way are we going which part is the foundation and i think that's that's critical uh, we, we would agree Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says all Scripture is theonoustos, it's breathed out by God. So the, the origin of Scripture is from God. The Holy Spirit of God carries people along to write what they write, and it's interesting. So because, why don't we just cite the me, people that were carried along? Well, let me just, let me just point, point this out, that in, in the, the time of the apostles, um, after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, the Apostle Peter refers to the writings of the Apostle Paul that were happening in his day. And he says in 2 Peter uh, 3.16, he says, uh, talking about things that Paul is writing that are difficult to understand, he says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that in the time of the Apostles, during the writing of these works, the Apostle Peter equates the letters of Paul, the writings of Paul, with the other holy scriptures. He's equating the writings of Paul with the mm -hmm. Old Testament scriptures. You're, you're making my up. point. No, I'm actually going against your point. What I'm saying is that they weren't just writing letters, and then the church comes later and says, well, yeah, we recognize that as authoritative. What they were giving was theonoustos, breathed out words of God. So what I was saying was, 
is that you are telling people today that Jesus rose again from the dead because why? The authoritative word of God tells me so. That's where I get it from that word of God. And I think it's important to recognize that distinction is that it is, I think, appropriate, and I don't think we should shy away from this, to be able to tell the world, well, the word of God says. I don't think we should shy away from that. And I think that's one of the concerns I have with this apologetic methodology is, mm -hmm. is teaching Christians to actually um, be afraid to say, well, God says. So again, there you see at the end, Jeff Durbin is kind of coming at the apologetics only approach and not basically leaning on the scripture. And so there was a lot to kind of break down in there. But but ultimately, you have Andy Stanley that is, you know, he did kind of make a, a very weird argument uh, about things that aren't in the scripture versus things that are. And I think this interaction between these two, it was about eight minutes long or so. This really, really shows that they're they are definitely p talking past one another, because I don't think that you can say seriously that either one of these guys does doesn't take the scriptures seriously, that either one of these guys uh, doesn't really, um, you know, want to lean on everything that we have from an evidentiary standpoint. It's that it's whatever they think is primary. It goes right back to their theses from the beginning where Andy thinks it's an, the event that is primary, whereas, you know, Jeff Durbin thinks it's just the, the scripture, that that's the primary thing that we should be focused on. So there's a, there's about a, you know, 15 or so minute little gap here at the end where the interaction I didn't find all too compelling to share with you all. So we're just going to forward all the way to the end. So we're going to get right into their final thoughts. So here's like about a nine minute interaction between the two of them where they're kind of giving their last pitches as it were. So, Hey, this is kind of my thought. This is my thought process on this. This is my main argument. So let's go ahead and go back into that. That is at the one hour and 23 minute and about 30 second mark. So let's get back into it here. I, I'm going to give a chance for you both to just give some final thoughts. So, Jeff, I'll, I'll start with you and then uh, and then I'll, I'll have Andy fin finish up. Well, I appreciate so much uh, being with you, Andy, today. Again, I, yeah. love and I love and respect you. And I'd love to maybe come hang out with you sometime and hash these issues out. Um, <laughs> although I read in your books uh, an analogy that I really hated because you used a golf, <laughs> a golf tee analogy. So it can't be golf because I think it's from the devil. Yeah, uh, I don't play golf. So okay, I'm with you. Okay. Or I don't hunt. I don't fish. I, I'm the greatest husband because I don't have any hobbies. I'm just all the time doing chores. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll just say um, that I don't think Andy really responded to any of the substance of the argument that I made. Um, and when he says uh, that our command, our marching orders in the New Testament are to love as I have loved you. Uh, the question is this, how did Jesus love them? Mm -hmm. He loved them according to God's law, which says, Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus says, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's quoting from Leviticus, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he says, all the law and the prophets are built upon these. So mm -hmm. if we're going to love like Jesus, then we're going to have a love for God and love for one another. And what's mm -hmm. that look like? Well, according to Jesus, all the law and the prophets are love God, love neighbor. The Ten Commandments, love God, love neighbor. Even down to the judicial, judicial law and animal husbandry laws have to do with love for neighbor. So I think we, 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 we have an, a problem when we disconnect that. We say, well, Jesus teaches a really supreme and valuable way of love that's so different from that harsh Old Testament law. No, Jesus teaches us what the law was pointing to all along. This is how you love God and love neighbor. Um, and um, when I when he talks about the Old Testament law not quoted in the New Testament as an authority, um, I think you're going to see it again different from what I just quoted from in First Corinthians chapter nine verse eight, even down to something that can see can be seen as so irrelevant to Christians today. When we read that animal husbandry laws, as he says this: Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say it the same? Then he quotes the law, mm -hmm. and he says, does he not see, certainly speak for our sake? It is written for our sake, not on human authority. On what? God's authority. And so I think that um, it's important to recognize that, the again, Ten Commandments are quoted with the assumption of continuity, but you're supposed to see it now in a spirit-filled, new covenant way. And, That's my says, point. and if somebody says, well, how are we supposed to know that? I would say... The New Testament gives you divine revelation on how you're supposed to view these things. Judicial, judicial law is assumed as continuous, the death penalty, festivals, all of that. And so uh, when and this is the final thing I'll say, and that this is uh, this is, I think, so critical. In Ephesians chapter two, the Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of the holiness code. Like, what are we supposed to keep? How come not the dietary laws, the holiness code? 
And the answer is so clear from the New Testament. It's all throughout. Those were dress rehearsals. Those were training wheels. Those don't apply anymore because now we have the substance who is Christ, and now we're filled with the Spirit of God. But what's interesting here is as Paul's addressing that very issue in Ephesians chapter 2 about the holiness code and all the rest, um, and, and throughout, he says in Ephesians 2.11, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, and this is critical here, guys, that you were at the same time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the, he says this, covenants, plural, of promise, singular, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. And so what Paul does there is he says that you in just Christ— my, You just made my point. Well, actually, actually, I haven't. I've made the opposite <laughs> point, because what he says is that now you are once strangers to these covenants, mm -hmm. plural, of promise— mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel, but now you've brought near to what? To the commonwealth of Israel, to the covenants, plural, of promise. If we've been brought near to the covenants of promise, then we've been brought near not just to the Abrahamic covenant, Andy, but to the blessings of what God gave to Moses, to the blessings of the Davidic covenant. In Christ, we've been brought near to the blessings of all those covenants, including the land, right? And this is what I would say. Well, now the Bible teaches us by divine re uh, revelation that that I promise is actually the whole world, not just the land. That's what the Bible teaches us. Well, but it also says this, and this is where I'll end, and this is something I encourage everyone to go yeah. read. De Deuteronomy chapter 4 does not see the law of God the way that Andy describes it, merely as sort of like, you know, law and harsh and just, you know, it's just a temporary covenant kind of a thing. It says that the nations were supposed to see this law and say, what kind of nation is this that has a God so near to it as this and has rules and statutes, a law so righteous as this law? Mm -hmm. The law of God was supposed to be seen as a blessing to the world. It was justice and righteousness and goodness that the world can look in it and say, what kind of God is this that has a law so perfect as this? Yep. I think when we, when we cast that away, I think we lose the benefits that are promised in Jeremiah 31, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 42, and Ezekiel 36. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, Sinai, the Sinai law was so superior to the Canaanite, Egyptian, Sumerian laws at the time. You're, that's a great point. And, and irresistible, I talk about how much better it was for women, for foreigners, for everybody. It was superior in every way. And it pointed to and it substantiated and supported the idea that Israel would eventually be a light to the Gentiles. So I agree with all that. I just don't think that you and I are involved or, you know, connected to that covenant. We weren't there. It wasn't for us. Well, but. I mean, I'll give you your final moment here now, um, Andy. Well, and one thing that did make me laugh when I was yeah. um, reading your book was you obviously anticipated that um, people like Jeff and many others would would disagree with you, or, 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 or I guess in your view, m misunderstand what you're saying. You, you, w at one point, you said, "Why would I blow up my career by writing this book?" Uh, which made me <laughs> laugh out loud. Um, yeah, but, but <clears throat> I, I saw it coming. Yeah, I, but okay. But we've heard Jeff, you know, essentially laying it down and saying this. You you know, we, 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 in so many ways, we're connected to that Old Testament law. Um, yeah. the, all yeah. of all of what Jesus has done is fulfill and help yeah. us to to live it in this new way. And and often you're saying, I agree with you, Jeff. Um, but obviously you've got a different sense of of how exactly then we're, well, we're meant to. I, to, to we view disagree it. over continuity and discontinuity. So let me just read what Jesus said: "A new command I give you," which means we miss this. I am stepping in front of Moses. This is something I'm giving you a new command as I love one another to which they thought, well, that's not new to which Jesus would have said, I'm not through because I'm about to redefine it as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And then here it is. I mean, we've all preached it and taught it, and memorized it by this, by this one thing. By this, everyone will know that you are my, not Moses. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another the way that I have loved you. And then again, he gave his life and, and defined love. We don't get to define love. So 
you can go the complicated way and try to figure out continuity and discontinuity. Those are fascinating conversations. Or you can just go the simple way and say, my responsibility is to love you the way that God and Christ love me, which is sacrificial. It's never self-serving. It's always honoring. It's always you first. He punctuated by punctuated it by washing the disciples' feet and say, now, if you ever get too big for your britches because you're Peter and Paul and the rock stars and the book of Acts, you just remember this night because in my kingdom, not like the Gentile world, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you must be a servant. You must be a slave of all. You get in the back of the back of the line. That's what it's going to look like. And that got the attention ultimately of the empire and the world. So there you have it. That's the end of the debate, uh, essentially the end of the debate. And it's kind of interesting there at the end. Uh, it's almost like, you know, Jeff Durbin is a very, very talented speaker, but it's almost like he didn't know how to end a debate. <laughs> it's like he looked down at his notes and he's like, well, I got like five or six more points to make. So I might as well just mush that into the very end. And then obviously Andy Stanley is one of the most skilled speakers uh, that we have in modern Christendom. And so he had a very cogent and to the point last minute response there. And he kind of was able to put a bow on most of his conversations comments there. But let's get into just my quick thoughts and reaction to this in its entirety. You know, hopefully again, you, you took my advice from the beginning and you listened to the entire thing on your own. So the first thing that I want to kind of point out is I cannot for the life of me find any high minded, biblically based person that thinks that Andy Stanley won this. Like the most high minded Bible people is not in the Stanley camp on this type of a thing. But at the same time, I can't really find most logic first people in the Durban camp, right? So uh, a Durban is appealing to the word of God and, and the strict, um, you know, interpretations of what the Bible says, whereas Andy Stanley is appealing to logic. And so that's the thing. Whenever you listen to something like this, it's difficult. It's difficult as a listener because we all have our different worldviews and we have our different upbringings. Maybe you were more fundamentalist. Maybe you were more liberal, liberal in your upbringing in terms of what you learned inside of the church. And so one of these reactions and one of these ways of comporting yourself is going to be more attractive to you. So I thought that that was pretty interesting that even on the back end, when I talk to people that like this, there's no one that went in, you know, an Andy Stanley kind of guy and then came out thinking, you know, that Jeff Durbin, he really won me over. I haven't really seen that. I'm sure there's people out there that have listened to that, that have kind of switched, but I haven't really seen that. Now on the other side of that, one thing that I found that was just interesting, and this is just kind of because I'm a nerd when it comes to just flowing on things. Andy Stanley looked to be flowing the entire time, right? You can see him looking directly at the camera. You can see him just interacting. You can see him obviously waiting for verbal pauses or just interjecting himself right in the middle of a sentence. And you can't really do that if everything you're you're wanting to do is bulleted out and planned to a T. Whereas Jeff Durbin was more so reading, which I was surprised by, to be honest, because when you watch any of Jeff Durbin's preaching, He's not really going off of notes, like which is why his preaching is so incredible in a lot of ways is because when he's quoting scripture, he's quoting it from memory and he's quoting it like not because he's memorized it in preparation for, you know, that speech so that he could just, you know, that, you know, give it to you. It's just in there. It's just in his brain. It's in his heart. It's in his soul. And it just comes out whenever it needs to during his sermon. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is Stanley throughout this conversation you can see him visibly getting more and more frustrated. And so towards the end, they, they both kind of cooled off a little bit and it just kind of, it was what it was. But I mean, I kind of pointed it out and you can hear it even in his voice, even if you weren't, you know, watching the video earlier on and all the way through the middle, he's just getting frustrated. It's like, he doesn't understand why Jeff Durbin can't just get it right. It's like, ah, why can't you just think my way? Like, why can't you just do it my way? Like, why aren't, why aren't you understanding this? Everyone else is understanding this. Right. And you can see that coming out and Jeff Durbin was relaxed the entire time. And so from a debate standpoint, I mean, one of the, one of the big rules of debating is don't let your emotions get the best of you. Now, if you want to use uh, some uh, emotion with your introduction, or if you want to use some emotion there at the end, go ahead and do that. But if you use a lot of emotion during the middle of the debate, it makes it seem like you don't have a lot of points. So it's like that person that can only win an argument if they're yelling. Right. Like, I mean, the, the moment you kind of put them in a corner, they just start, ah, oh, well, you're this and you're that. And I don't have to listen to you anyway. And you can't judge me. Blah. You know, it was kind of one of those types of things. Obviously, Andy Stanley wasn't wilding out and going crazy. But at the same time, it's just like, Andy, let him talk. 
Like this is an interaction and you keep interjecting and you're not exactly making yourself look good. So I thought that was interesting. And the the thing that's that's really cool as you dig in this a little bit more is if you dig into Jeff Durbin's ministry, you see this kind of relaxed spirit in his sermons, in his sidewalk ministry. Um, but to be honest with you, I've never really seen Andy Stanley respond like this. And, you know, there's good reason for that because he's typically in a very controlled environment where he's speaking in front of his congregation to a bunch of people that like him and typically agree with him. And so it was interesting to see this type of a thing because we've seen Jeff Durbin. If you, if you watch any of the Apologia Studios videos, you see him interacting with people. And these are sometimes 20, 30, 40 minute long interactions with these people. And they are not nice interactions for the most part, but Jeff Durbin doesn't back down. He he's very, very bold and he, you know, he's got everything in his life is attached to the scripture. And so it was just interesting seeing Andy Stanley, not in that controlled environment. Again, I made this point several times as well. It seemed like they were talking past one another. Maybe you kind of picked up on that a little bit. That was a little bit frustrating because it was like, okay, it's okay for one of you to cede a point to the other person. Like that's another kind of debate tactic is where you have common ground, be the first person to acknowledge it, acknowledge the common ground, acknowledge that you understand their point of view and that they've kind of brought you around to a better level of understanding of their point of view and then make your point, right? You're kind of buttering them up before you smack them across the face, right? It's kind of one of those types of situations. But the last thing I wanted to kind of point out here is I kind of have a a little bit of a dichotomy of feelings when I see pastors like this in conflict. And so there's one part of me that's like, ah, this is exactly what, you know, progressives and atheists and all that want to see. They want to see a couple of guys that are supposedly on the same team arguing with one another. And so part of me is like, ah, that's not really the best, best look. Right. But then there's the other side of me. That's just like, Hey, if we could have some more disputatious conversations between pastors and we can have more pastors going at it with one another and like trying to make sure that we're believing the right way so that they, we can teach our flocks the right way. Is it really that bad? I mean, one of my favorite things about the Bible is where we see where Paul traveled a very, very long way to rebuke Peter to his face because Peter was basically being racist and how he was interacting with certain people in the area that he was doing ministry. Right. And I mean, imagine if we didn't have that story. I mean, it's just a couple of lines in the scripture, but if we didn't have that story, you would think to yourself, ah, I guess these people never really fought. And um, I'm going to do some future episodes on people like William Farrell and some folks like that, that were very, very, uh, in your face about certain things. And if they knew you were wrong, they were not going to hint at it. They were going to come right at you. But at this point, you know, you've stuck with us this long. It's like, okay, we need to declare a winner at some point. And you guys might disagree with me here. And um, you may already know kind of where I'm going to be going with this. But if I have to pick a winner for this one interaction without any of the other interactions that I know from these two guys beforehand, I've got to give this to Jeff Durbin. And I'm going to give it to Jeff Durbin based on two things. Uh, number one is his main argument where, uh, it's the main mic drop, mic drop moment, right? Whenever it's like, what is the basis of your faith? Andy Stanley thinks he's got him. And he says the word of the living God. If there is one kind of clippable, quotable Instagrammy thing that you can pull from this, it's that. And I would have said that the same if it had gone the other way. You know, if Jeff Durbin had tried to make a point like that, and then Andy responded in a way that just literally stopped Jeff Durbin in his tracks, I would have probably given it to him. But in terms of what we were looking at, which is a controlled time limit type of debate type thing that's on this, you know, uh, podcast radio show, you've got to give it to Jeff Durbin there. But the secondary thing was his appeal to scripture based methodology, uh, as opposed to the apologetic method. So that is something that I've thought about, but it wasn't until I listened to this interaction where I kind of thought to myself, okay, some people really will need the apologetic method to understand, but it's only whenever you get into the scripture that you really find your foundation for any of the apologetic method to begin with. So you can appeal uh, to Greek teleology, you can appeal uh, to logic and reason, you can appeal to those things. But again, if we, if we don't have the scripture, and that is the totality of the scriptures, Old and New Testament, you can't really operate moving forward. And that really undergirded his, his main argument. You know, he had his mic drop moment, which was the best moment, but the best argument is that Christians should be able to lean on, well, God says this. 
right? And so most of us were trying to, you know, use logic and reasoning and bring people to our point of view using those things. But we have the ace of spades. We have it already ready to go. We have the trump card. And that is the reality that we can just say, hey, guys, God says, that's why I'm saying it to you. All right, guys, thanks for sticking in with us uh, throughout the rest of this. But before we let you go, we're going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically, we do that by providing content like this podcast that helps you forge spiritual, mental and physical toughness. And so I'm going to kind of give you some mental resilience today. I want to give you all of the different resources that are going to be here in the show notes. So the very first thing and the most important thing, as you've probably seen by now, is the actual YouTube video of the interaction between Andy Stanley and Jeff Durbin. But then I want to give you these as well. So kind of the crux of this whole thing was the irresistible book. And so that is Andy Stanley's book. So I have uh, the irresistible book claiming, or sorry, reclaiming the new that Jesus unleashed for the world. And so that uh, is a copy or not a copy of that, but a link to that on Amazon. But then we get into the aftermath series. So it's part three of the aftermath series where Andy Stanley makes the now infamous unhitched comment or the unhitch the old Testament from the new Testament comment. But I have the series link here, but I also have links to the YouTube videos for part one, part two, and then the last part, part three of this series, because if you really want to understand the context, and if you're not an Andy Stanley person or you haven't listened to him before, I would urge you to listen to all three of these, because if you just listen to that one section of part three of the Aftermath series, yes, it's going to ring a little bit weird, but if you've watched his Easter sermons, if you've watched him for any length of time, you can kind of understand why he said it the way that he did and why he brought the argument to us in the way that he did. Also, I have the YouTube video of Jeff Durbin's original refutation of Andy Stanley, and so this was about a year ago. He, he did it on the Apology at a Studios page. And so he basically goes line by line refuting uh, what Andy Stanley was coming out and saying. I also want to remind you again, go back to episode 23 of this podcast. It's called Andy Stanley, a heretic. And so just make sure you check that out wherever you get your podcast. And then the last thing, the point that Jeff Durbin made there at the very beginning was the interaction with William Lane Craig and Ben Shapiro. And so I have the YouTube link to the video of the Ben Shapiro show Sunday special episode 50, which features William Lane Craig. So guys, thanks a lot for listening to the podcast. We really do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. Guys, if you use the hashtag Undaunted Life, we'll be sure to find your post and give it a thumbs up. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, that is how this podcast is going to continue to grow. So please leave us a five-star review on wherever you're listening to this and also leave us a few sentences letting us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. So if you want me to speak on your podcast, speak to your men's group, your men's event, your coat, your team, or whatever you want me to do, hit me up info at undaunted.life. That's the email info at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life and you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com backslash undauntedlife. Check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.